Hello, everybody, and welcome into episode number 330 of the Bible 2021 podcast. We are reading 2 Peter chapter 2 today, and we have a pretty interesting focus question. Did God cast evil angels into hell? And we're also going to be talking about the dangers of false teachers and touching on one of my favorite biblical topics of all, were the sons of God in Genesis 6 actually angels that had intimate relationships with humans? Well, our goal on this show is to encourage you to listen to the word, think about the word, understand the word, and follow the word. And we do that by daily producing and releasing an episode of the show where we read the word of God and talk about it. We do have a website. It's the easiest way to subscribe to the show. And if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. Our website is Bible2021.com. That's Bible2021.com. You can also find the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and plenty of other places. Thanks for telling friends and neighbors about the show. We appreciate when you do that and share us on social media. And boy, is it fantastic when somebody leaves a review on Apple Podcasts. Well, our primary focus today is on something quite mysterious and maybe a little on the esoteric side. But let's first discuss the overall important point of the chapter 2 Peter 2. This is a stark and sobering chapter. And it opens with a very concerning warning about the certain infiltration of false teachers into the church. Verse 1 says, There were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved ways, and the way of truth will be maligned because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Their condemnation, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. Yikes. Be aware, church, says Peter, that false teachers will seek to assail the people of God in the same way that false prophets did in the Old Testament. They're going to masquerade as genuine. They're going to seem to be, at least on the surface, followers of Jesus. They're going to talk about God, but their teaching, the things they teach and proclaim, will ultimately deny Jesus and deny his teachings and deny his word. The only way to recognize them will likely be by their fruit and by familiarity with God's word to know where the deviations and destructive heresies are being taught. By the way, the word heresy is a theological word that simply means like a different teaching or a different doctrine. In this case, it's a different doctrine other than what the Bible itself teaches. Adding to the word, as Joseph Smith did, twisting the word, as many sects do today, this is what is being warned about. Christians should be on their guard against these destructive heresies and the false teachers who bring them, and they should take solace in the comfort of verse 9, which says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Well, Second Peter 2, in discussing these false teachers, also brings us one of the more mysterious and frankly quite fascinating Bible passages there is. Beginning in verse 4, For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell, and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, this is an almost parallel passage to what we read in Jude, verses 5 and 6 and 7, which reads, I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who do not believe, and the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns 
committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Well, both of these passages are written in the context of discussing false teachers, and both passages indicate that the punishment of these false teachers is sure and certain in light of the fact that God has already punished the angels who sinned and, quote, did not keep their own position, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These angels God has cast into hell, according to the CSB translation of Second Peter 2. And according to both passages, they are chained up and kept in utter or deep or profound darkness until the return of Jesus and the judgment day. <laughs> Tell you what, these passages raise a ton of questions, right? Uh, We'll cover two of them today. Like, for instance, what event is this passage referring to? When did a bunch of angels sin and get cast into uh, outer darkness? And on that question, theologian Dr. Thomas Schreiner, a Southern Baptist writer and uh, seminary professor, links the sin of the angels in Jude and Second Peter 2 with the Genesis 6 incident of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And I agree with him. Of that, Dr. Schreiner writes, We can almost be certain that Peter followed Jewish tradition at this point and referred to, in Second Peter 2, the sin angels committed with women in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And then he lists off a uh, number of documents in the Jewish tradition that talks about this. If you want to see that list, please do come to our website. It is Bible2021.com and search up this episode, uh, the show notes for this episode, episode number 330, and you'll see a listing of those documents there. He continues, the sin committed by angels was sexual intercourse with the daughters of men. Three reasons support the view that Peter thought of angels who committed sexual sin in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. First, such an interpretation as the texts I listed indicate was widespread in Jewish tradition. Peter's readers would naturally have understood the account in terms of such a tradition unless Peter indicated clearly that he was departing from the common understanding of his day. Peter gave no indication, however, that he differed from the tradition. Second, nor would such an understanding be difficult for Peter's readers. The Greeks also had the story of the Titans, which is kind of similar in some respects to Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Third, Jude almost certainly understood the story of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 to refer to angels who sinned, given that he was influenced by the book of 1st Enoch, and the account is more prominent in 1st Enoch than any other work. It is quite unlikely that Peter veered off in another direction from Jude, for regardless of the question of literary dependence, it is obvious that Jude and 2nd Peter both drew from common tradition in some form. So Dr. Schreiner concludes that the sons of God having relation with the daughters of men in Genesis 6 does refer to heavenly beings or angels. Other people think that they uh, that passage refers to um, godly descendants of Seth or something else along those lines. It just so happens I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Schreiner. And on the website today, I have added a much longer, probably another 1,500 words explanation from Dr. Schreiner as to why this was the predominant view of the first century day that Genesis 6 is talking about sons of God having relations with daughter of men. If you're interested in that question, you can come check it out on the website. I'm not going to read it all because not everybody is interested in that question. And that will get us to the second question. Were the angels that Peter is talking about in 2 Peter 2 and Jude is talking about in Jude 6, Were they actually sent to what we think of as hell? Like right now, is there a bunch of angels chained up in the deep, utter, profound darkness of hell? Well, here again is Dr. Schreiner on this question. He says, the NIV translation says that the angels were sent to hell. So does the CSB, by the way. But Peter did not use the normal word for hell here, Gehenna. But he used the Greek verbal participle, Tartarosas, from which we get our word Tartarus. Tartarus in Greek literature refers to the underworld, and here we have another indication that Peter desired to com- communicate with his readers in terms of what they would understand. The word hell in 
English is misleading if it suggests the final punishment the book of Revelation and Jesus talks about, since the verse makes quite clear that the climactic judgment upon the return of Jesus still awaits the angels. The term Tartarus suggests that the angels are both confined and restrained because of their sin. The language of confinement could be interpreted literally as if the angels are restricted to a physical locality. More likely, the language is symbolic, says Dr. Schreiner, conveying the idea that the angels who sinned are now restrained in some way because of their sin, that God has limited their fear of operation. The last phrase in the verse, held for judgment, conveys a similar idea. The future judgment of these angels is certain, and presently they are being kept by God for their punishment on the eschatological day, the return of Jesus. In the case of the angels, then, the punishment has two dimensions. The restriction imposed immediately as a result of their sin, and the ultimate punishment they will receive on the day of the Lord's return. So fascinating kind of thing that Peter is talking about here, that angels sinned and are now being punished by God and will ultimately be punished by God in an even greater way. Uh, well, let's go ahead and read our passage in total. It is Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. There were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved ways, and the way of truth will be maligned because of them. They will exploit you in their greed with made-up stories. Their condemnation, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. And if he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral, For as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. Bold, arrogant people, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. They consider it a pleasure to carouse in broad daylight. They are spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. They seduce unstable people and have hearts trained in greed. Children under a curse, they have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of wickedness but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water, mists driven by a storm. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them, for by uttering boastful empty words they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. For if, having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated, the last state is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after knowing it, to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a washed sow returns to wallowing in the mud. Wow, wow, wow. That is a tough passage, my friends, and a powerful one. 
Well, let us close with our Bible memory passage for the month of November, which is almost up. It's John 14, verse 6, and it reads, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Good day to you, friends, and Godspeed.